Howdy, howdy, y'all. Welcome back to Some Antics. I'm Ben Myers. Today, I'm joined by the one and only Mike Peruvian Idol, Aparicio. Mike, how's it going? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to have you on. I'm also super excited because we're already kicking off with uh, nearly a hype train. So I think, I say, let's go for it. Let's let's sob let's it up. It. Give people those tuna the cat emotes. Um, feel free to, to gift those subs. I super appreciate everyone who subscribes and funds the stream. Those, uh, those subscriptions do fund closed captions, uh, professionally made closed captions. So, uh, just know that it is going to a great cause. Um, oh my god. I just, I just got, uh, timed out for spamming to the, uh, Oh the no. <laughs> I just enabled Nightbot and rookie mistake. Oh my god. Uh, I call it, I call it Nightbot. Nightbot. <laughs> It's pretty aggressive on the default settings. That's wow. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. So thank you to to everyone who has subscribed, which includes you, Mike. Uh, and and thank you to Adrian who's resubscribed. Um, and yeah, I I say uh, let's go ahead and get into this. So first of all, in case folks haven't seen you around, uh, who are you? Who is Mike? Uh, sure. So I am a uh, design systems engineer. Uh, I work at a startup here in Chicago called Brogy. Uh, we essentially help connect uh, alcohol retailers with, uh, with distributors. And that's uh, like a B2B app. Um, and uh, prior to that, I was at Groupon for almost nine years and uh, did some design system stuff over there. And uh, yeah, I've been working on the web now for Gosh, almost uh, actually over twenty five years, if you can believe that. <laughs> oh man, that's yeah. I, I look at like my like three or four years, right? I'm like, that's pretty good so far. Um, hey, Sarah, thank you so much for the subscription. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, and so recently, you and I have kind of, uh, I guess, gotten to know each other via the front end horse community. So perhaps I will shout okay. that out. Um, yeah. Let's see. New commands. Exciting. Um, and also, you stream. I do, yeah. Uh, occasionally. Every Friday uh, from uh, 1 to 3, I do a little uh, office hours stream where I answer questions about uh, CSS, uh, design systems, 11B. Uh, but usually it's just me rambling for two hours and uh, having fun with, with the chat. All right. Steph's here. Steph here. Yeah, lots of lovely, lovely people. We got Ryan, Joe, Ryan Steph, here. Anthony. So many, so many great people. Anthony does want to know how much of your coding power comes from your goatee. Uh, very little. In fact, I'm sh I'm going to be shaving this. Uh, maybe I'll do it live on stream. Oh goodness! I'm shave this for Halloween. Uh, so my, my I have a two year old son, hmm. and uh, this this will be his third Halloween. And we do like a uh, well, I should say I force him to do. Uh, kind of like famous movie duos. So uh, the first, his first Halloween, we were uh, Maverick and Goose, and then last year we were the Blues Brothers, and this year we're gonna be uh, Dumb and Dumber. So, <laughs> so I have to shave. I have to shave for Halloween. All right. Uh, oh man, Steph's saying you're coming through a little quiet. I think that's probably due to my own setup. Is this better, Steph? Oh, I think that's gonna be better. All right. Okay. Uh, let us know in the chat, by the way, and we can maybe do some live audio debugging. Always, always an adventure. Um, I was a little too comfortable back here. So you know, all the way back here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So, yeah. Um, today we're doing design system work. Um, can you... What is your pitch for design systems? Why, why do we need them? Why should we care? That's a great question. Uh... So the way I frame design systems is that it's a uh, like a common language, right, between design, engineering, and product uh, that helps us uh, basically uh, describes how we create products for our company specifically, right? So uh, if you've seen, uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen like uh, uh, material design, Salesforce's lightning design, right? there's a lot of public facing design systems, but like uh, people aren't necessarily using other companies' design systems to solve their problems. Uh, not exactly sure why all of these companies share their design systems publicly when no one else besides them is using them, but I find it tremendously helpful in uh, kind of gleaning 
information from other systems about how they solve their problems. Um, but really, like, for me, there's, uh, there's a disconnect between design and engineering, right? And this, this happens at a lot of companies where we hire designers for their visual design skills, and we hire engineers for their uh, kind of their computer science uh, skills, right? And the, and the engineers end up having to whiteboard a uh, you know a sorting algorithm or something, and no one ever asks them like, hey, what's the difference between a, a block element and an inline element, right? And then on the design side, they're they're looking at their portfolio, asking about uh, user research and things like that, but no if a designer can code, it's usually like a bonus. It's not necessarily something that they're hiring for. So you end up with this kind of skill gap where the designers are uh, making pictures of websites and handing those to engineers and saying, make this website, right? It's like kind of like if you, uh, if, if a painter were to paint a picture and give it to a sculptor and said, make me a statue of this, right? And this, the sculptor is like, okay, well, how big is this supposed to be? What does the back look like, right? What's all this stuff you have in the background? I can't sculpt that, right? And so you end up with this thing that doesn't quite look like the designer's vision. And there's always this kind of uh, tr uh, kind of trade-off, right, between uh, you know what the designer intended and what the finished product is. And because we uh, are typically like on this roadmap, right, we have to just kind of move forward, and we never really fix those things. And so a design system kind of helps. Uh, facilitate uh, getting rid of some of that, you know, inaccuracy, right? Like helping the designers, helping the finished product look like what the designer intended um, and through the use of various tools and documentation, things like uh, on the design side of uh, like a UI kit in, we'll say, Figma or Sketch. Um, and then on the engineering side, a component library, uh, maybe a CSS framework to support that. And so, uh, yeah, essentially, uh, you know, if I'm doing my job well, like none of the engineers should have to write CSS, and so, uh, so that that usually you know, speeds speeds up along the pro the process of getting things from kind of concept to production. So, you mentioned if you're doing your job well, the devs shouldn't necessarily have to finagle CSS. In reality, how often do you think that holds up? Uh, I, I would say it probably pretty well because we're still pretty small. Uh, uh, since I started, I started about a year ago, and at the time we had about ten engineers, and we've since ramped up to about forty engineers. Um, and so, uh, so in my role, I actually am developing a CSS framework that um, kind of takes what the designers have built in Figma and and keeps those two things in sync. And so the engineers, in order to uh, to create a new design, they only really need the CSS framework. They don't need to write CSS on top of that, generally. Maybe in, in some instances to like, um, uh, you know, to position something, you know, something that's like very feature specific. But in general, um, they're, they're very rarely writing their own CSS. Um, and we do still have like some legacy CSS to contend with. So kind of the approach that we're taking is like, if, if you're building something new, use the CSS framework. If you're touching anything old, refactor that to make use of the framework. So at some point, hopefully, uh, we should be entirely off of that legacy CSS and uh, solely on the the, uh, the the CSS framework that we build. Gotcha. Um, if you hear various rustling and clatter sounds, uh, my cat is currently trying to break out of the office. Um, so yeah, okay. So are design systems just about making things like visually cohesive? Um, well, since since like one of the themes of your show is accessibility, uh, one of the great things about design systems is that it, it allows us to kind of bake in uh, rules about accessibility, right? So we can we can um, when we're developing our color palette, for example, we can make sure that all of our colors are accessible. Um, we can make sure that our type scale is is legible, right? Like no one's ever gone to a website and been like, "Well, I wish this font was smaller," <laughs> right? So we can make sure that that, that scale is something that's legible. Um, you know, I I'm by no means an accessibility expert. Uh, I I do what I can, but um, a design system is certainly a way that you can kind of um, create rules around different patterns in, in order to, for the developers to use them in an accessible way and uh and and 
how to make it so that the developers don't even necessarily have to think about it if they're using the patterns correctly uh, according to the system. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think let's go ahead and dive into this. So I am now sharing my screen. Um, Y'all go follow Mike on Twitter. Um, and, and yeah, so today we are building out a, to, to demonstrate, we're, we're building out a design system for a site called Dog the Horse. Can you, can you explain what's going on here? Absolutely. So uh, I have a little side project called uh, Dogs of Dev, right? If you're, if you're a developer and you have a dog, uh, you can go to dogsof.dev and uh, uh, click the yellow button to add your dog to the site. And um, it's just a little fun project that I came up with. Uh, I like dogs. And I have one just out of frame here. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I was kind of tired of all the doom scrolling. And uh, uh, so I made this site where I could just look at dogs, right? Unfiltered dogs. And uh, so if you're a designer or developer, uh, yep, Ryan's dog is uh, top, top build right now. Uh, there's Riley. So um, yeah, if you like dogs, uh, it's a great site. But so dogs, of course. So we have our little front end horse community that, that uh, where we all kind of congregate. And uh, so dogs, of course, is a subset of dogs of dev that features just dogs from the front end horse discord. <laughs> so it's Hacktober, right? Hacktoberfest is going on. And so it's a great opportunity to kind of like uh, expand your skill set, right? Get mm -hmm. into things that that you haven't had a chance to 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 dip into, um, and so I think what we'll, we'll kind of go through today is how we can get started with a design system, right? On like a small project, and then through that you can kind of see how you might apply that to maybe your your job, right? Uh, where you start with something small and evolve that over time, right? Because typically one of the big challenges with design systems is getting buy-in, right? We hear a lot about convincing management and peers to 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 build a design system right and so i've always been kind of a ask for forgiveness and not permission kind of guy right so i just my advice is just to build it and um you know eventually people will see the value in it and then at that point you can kind of uh, get more resources for it but if you start small with just uh you know your color palette, for example, or a single component like a button, uh, you can really greatly reduce the time that you spend working on those things and, and people will start to see the value in that and then you can kind of expand on that. All right. Um, so yeah, we've got Dog the Force and, and currently it is, uh, it is an unstyled mess, more or less. I mean, there are styles, it is, but it, it's hardly like the, the, hardly the aesthetic choice. Yeah, so basically what I did is uh, you can see on our HTML uh, window here that it's just pretty basic markup. Uh, I didn't add any classes. Like if I were to build this myself, I probably would add you know some classes to, to style everything. But since this is very basic, uh, and I just kind of want to more illustrate uh, how you would develop the system, uh, that's kind of what I went with. So in the CSS, if you scroll down below our uh, tokens, I'll talk about tokens in a second. Um, but I just ooh, right at the very top of below the yeah right there. So I have my 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 little three line uh, reset, which basically is just box sizing, set that to border box, uh, remove the margins from everything, and then set font to inherit. Which basically like for some reason on buttons like they use a different font, uh, and so inheriting uh, setting inherit uh, sets the the type to basically whatever your your body is for buttons and inputs and things like that but that's like a super simple um kind of reset uh and then i'm doing some trickery with uh, the image to to make it square so uh, aspect ratio is now supported in evergreen browsers so we're setting the aspect ratio to square um and then using object fit to cover so this picture of cupcake is actually not a square and so with this, uh, with, with these styles, we're able to uh, make sure that all these images are square, regardless of their, the, the image's actual aspect ratio. And then below that, you'll see I have a bunch of styles that are using design tokens and uh, the uh, like CSS custom properties. And then you see this revert after everyone. So basically what that's saying is uh, if this, if this um, 
custom property does not exist, the default set that to revert. So it's basically like there's no styles, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to style this page without touching any CSS, without touching any HTML, uh, only through design tokens. So I realize now that we didn't talk about design tokens at all. Yeah, so let's let's do that. What is a design token? So uh, so our design system, right, is, is basically just a collection of visual style decisions, right? Uh, we have our color palette, our type scale, uh, our spacing, things like that, right? And so design tokens are a way for us to codify that. Uh, it's basically just variables, right? But these are variables that we can apply across platforms. So um, while while these tokens can be used on web, we can also apply them uh, on Android, on iOS, um, uh, Keynote, you know, if we wanted to. Um, there is a, um, I'm not sure if you have the, the uh, Notion doc, uh, but there's a link there that says design tokens format module. There's a, a design systems working group uh, that's currently working to kind of standardize the format of these tokens so that they can be used with um, various uh, design tools, engineering tools, right? So uh, like the idea is like long-term you would be able to uh, you would be able to consume tokens in Figma and also uh, in your in your you know dev environment, right? Without having to have like a bunch of plugins and things like that. So uh, so style dictionary. This is a uh, open source repo that uh, by Amazon um, is basically a way that you can store these these key value pairs right in in JSON and then export it to various um, uh, various, you know, uh, formats, right? So uh, SAS or uh, uh, XML, you know, depending on what, what platform. Um, and so basically these two things kind of work hand in hand, right? So this, this design tokens format module that the, uh, that the design tokens working group is working on is, is helping to like kind of like standardize how these things are. So long story short, uh, what we're doing with uh, with our dogs, of course, is we're uh, we're making these variables that we can use uh, to store our design decisions. So, um, so the way that that I approach design tokens, like a lot of a lot of companies, uh, they basically just store like color values in a variable and call it a day. But the problem with that is like let's say our brand color is uh, black, right? Um, and we decide, you know, hey, we're going to do a rebrand, and now our our brand color is purple. So now we would have to like go in everywhere where our brand color is used and find it, you know, do a basically like find and replace every instance of like black with purple, right? And so it doesn't really, you know, it it helps you in a sense that it, it's replacing like the hex value or the you know the HSL value or whatever. Um, but if you mm -hmm. end up changing that value, you still have to kind of do this whole find and replace thing, and it's a bit to do. So the, the way that uh, a lot of people approach it is to have kind of multiple layers of tokens, and uh, the way that I uh, describe these are uh, global tokens, which are basically all the raw values uh, of your system. So your color palette, your spacing values, your type sizes, things like uh, your border radiuses, or border radii, I should say, uh, uh, things like animation, timing functions, stuff like that. Any any kind of value that you find in your CSS, you can uh, you can have those values in your uh, global tokens. And so then there's another layer uh, beyond that called contextual tokens, right? So this describes kind of how those global values are used. So while we might have this color palette that includes a lot of different colors, we don't necessarily want people using those colors you know, willy nilly, right? We don't want people using like yellow text because that's probably not accessible, right? So we can we can create these contextual tokens that say this is the color of text when it's a uh, when it's our brand color. Uh, this is the color of text when it's subdued, or this is the color of text when it's um, you know an error, right? And so we're we're just very specifically saying like this is how and when to use those colors, whether it's for text, background, icons things like that. And similarly with um, font sizes, like this is uh, what the, the font weight is on headers. 
um, et cetera, right? Okay. And then the third level is component tokens. So here we're basically replacing every style declaration from our CSS with these component tokens. And these component tokens can refer back to contextual tokens. They can refer back to uh, global tokens. But I, uh, essentially, uh, this is what allows us to change uh, the visual styles of individual components without touching any CSS. Um, so uh, really, like these three levels of tokens like allow us to to choose like to what extent we we make these changes, right? So if we want our uh, let's say our our blue color, is, we're changing that. Uh, Kind of the, the shade of, of blue right that we're using mm -hmm. we can do that in the global tokens but maybe uh you know for our brand we want to apply like a new accent color and and we only want to change that color like when it's used for backgrounds or when it's used um for text right yeah because in, in the contextual tokens because one color can be used in multiple contexts right so like it, right. it yeah so so you want to update it just in the the places where the context itself needs to change. You don't want to have to figure out does everywhere where I use this one hex code need to be replaced? You, That's right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so global, we can change something everywhere. Contextual, we can change it among multiple components, and then the component level, we can we can fine tune it and adjust the styles for just one component. Um, and so that that gives us these different layers of control over, over how we we make these changes. Um, so yeah, for our project here, uh, we can start with the global tokens, and um, you know, essentially, what we want to do is like, you know, I, I have just some kind of some default values here, but we can like we can play with these and see like what it looks like, right? And that's the cool thing about working with tokens is that like I don't have to like change a bunch of CSS properties because I've already kind of written those here to save time, but. Um, we can once we have the tokens in place we can make changes to it and see very quickly like what the outcome of that is um, okay so uh i guess we can just uncomment this whole block of global tokens if you highlight yeah just highlight yeah and uh, then it's from, like from there to the end and then i think it's command uh, angle yeah there we go so uh we probably won't see a huge change there um seeing a few things just, already it seems like the the hover behaviors oh. change the font. Oh right, yeah. I I did uh, I did add a little hover behavior. I don't remember what that's tied to. Um, but aside from that, it's it's largely the same, right? Yeah. Um, because like where where most of the uh the styling is happening is in the contextual and uh and uh component tokens, right? Um, so if we just like kind of take a look at this, we have some colors here, uh. You know, black and white. Maybe our black color is something that's not like pure black. We can we can adjust that here. Yeah. By like like adjusting the uh, the lightness value, that third value. Um, like maybe we want that to be ten, right? Um, and I, I don't know we'll, that we'll see any effects there until we apply other tokens. Um, but um, yeah. So I see. A lot of times, like people will will want to add a lot of values to kind of fill things out, right? Like maybe you have like your your kind of, you know, your gray palette, for example, right? And you want to have all these steps in between black and white, um, but without necessarily knowing whether or not you're going to use all of those. Uh, so what I recommend is like just come up with the colors uh, that you need and then add, add them as needed. Um, and another thing that I do, if you notice, there's uh, like numbers appended to blue and yellow. Um, these are just kind of like a general, uh, you know, similar to like type scale, right? Like, like or sorry, uh, font weight, right? Uh, uses like kind of this hundreds scale mm -hmm. uh, where like 400 is, is normal, 600 is uh, sensible, etc. Um, and so these numbers kind of help us at a glance know whether one color is lighter or darker than another so some you know sometimes you'll just see colors like you know cornflower and <laughs> you know like kind of like the css color names right but you mm -hmm. don't really know whether dodger blue is lighter or darker than cornflower blue right um and so by just saying this is blue right yeah um because because maybe we you know 
maybe we'll it's not always going to be cornflower blue you know maybe we'll change from cornflower blue to diver blue mm-hmm. um so by just using like the closest thing like blue and giving it a number we can kind of know at a glance uh whether one color is lighter or darker than another uh this comes particularly in handy with like our gray scale because a lot of times we have all these different gray values and, and it's, it gets like light gray medium gray uh you know okay so um, the smaller the number the lighter it is the, the lighter it is right? okay uh and then the the other thing that i do and it, it's it's hard to really see with this kind of small sample um but i use the numbering as as a as a kind of guideline for accessibility for color contrast so i will make sure that blue 600 is like the dark the lightest color that will pass on a white background or a uh, like a 100 background, right? So mm-hmm. if we have, let's let's say we had a blue uh, 100, that would be a very light blue. Uh, that that would uh, that like a dark blue or black text would would pass on that would be four and a half to one, uh, or you know, however, whichever whether you want, depending on whether you want to do like triple A or double A, but double A is four and a half uh, to one contrast ratio. So um, so this helps kind of make rules around that and so things like um you know a yellow 400 on a white background is not going to be accessible but if we're using that on like a darker background it should be accessible um it's hard to really visualize that yeah that's kind of that's kind of the idea that we're going for um yeah do you have any questions around that around that i i think i'm Good. Uh, chat, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask away. I, I think Mike's in the chat as well, so... Um, yeah, uh, I, I think... So, just, I guess, to to recap here, our, our global tokens, and so far we've just been talking about the, the colors here. You mm-hmm. you started with a couple of, like, your, your core colors. Um, every color is appended with, like, this, like, hundreds um, type mm-hmm. number. And the smaller that number, the lighter it is. The bigger the number, the darker it is. Six hundred is about your your normal, right? And it should right. reasonably pass color contrast requirements against a very light background. So a like white or like you said, like some color dash one hundred, uh, yep. and and so so long as you're sticking to like your your six hundreds against your light background, you should be good. Yeah, and this is like a super basic palette, right? So uh, what, basically what we're doing here is like black is going to be our text, white is going to be our background for the most part, blue is our brand color, and then yellow is like our accent, and then there's okay. yellows because our button has kind of a highlight uh, when you hover on it. And so, you know, as we build features, like the, the other thing that I that I uh, kind of suggest when you're building a design system is to let the features dictate what goes in the system. Okay. Um, so, for example, when I came to Proby and we had nothing, right? We had a new feature coming out, and we we wrote all of the uh, all of the tokens and everything, and all of the CSS styles that we needed to build this one feature, right? And so that required doing text, it required doing uh, buttons, some form elements, maybe some tables, right? And so then when we build the next feature. We've already built like ninety percent of the stuff that we needed from the last feature, and so now we're just adding new stuff to to accommodate this feature. So every successive feature requires less and less design system work, and it's more about getting people, uh, you know, familiar with the system, how to how to take the the CSS framework and like um, uh, implement it, right? Um, so. I'm just looking at the uh, Paul's question here in the chat. Is it common for companies to use, have their design system of other? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, GitLab using Bootstrap Review. Um, I, I like to I like to say that design systems should be like tech agnostic, right? So it can work on any stack. Like the thing about design tokens mm-hmm. is that you can use it with any stack, right? So you could implement this, you know, in SaaS. You could implement it, you know, uh, you could make your components in in Vue or like at Proby, we're switching from Angular to Svelte. And so we're using that kind of transition as an opportunity to uh, make sure that the the new components use the, the design system. But uh, largely like 
we, we want this thing to be resilient to changes because like our design tools change. Like a lot of people are shifting from Sketch to Figma now and in two years it's gonna be some other new thing. And then on the, obviously on the development side, every two years it's like some, some new hotness, right? Uh, we're all going to be doing stuff on Slinkity in another year, so <laughs> it's like you got you, you can't really tie your system to a specific uh, stack. Yeah, and then we've got another uh, question, uh, or I guess comment from uh, the original Andrew. I'm curious on the overall choice for using HSL versus Hex, which is not good for usage in SCSS uh, versus RGB. Uh, my team at Nike uses Hex, and it's definitely been a hassle so far. Yeah, I've, I've started using HSL just because it's a lot easier to kind of wrap your head around mm -hmm. what changes to any of those three values are doing. Uh, and it's easier to kind of do math on it. So I can, you know, uh, just if I want to make a color lighter, I can just bump the, like what I did with the yellow here is just to reduce the lightness by 15% yeah. to get a lighter color, but still with that same kind of shade. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really, it can be whatever you want it to be, right? Mm -hmm. what, whatever the, the, the thing. So earlier I said that a design system is a common language between design engineering and uh, and product, right? But it's also an agreement, right? We're saying that this is how we're going to do it here. Mm -hmm. And whether that's, you know, we all agree that we're using hex values or we all agree we're using HSL or whatever, particularly when you're doing cross-platform, sometimes you're, you have to use multiple things, right? So maybe color yellow 200 is a uh, HSL value on web, but on Android, it's like a eight digit hex, right? Where the, the other two digits are the, the opacity, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so like, but when we're all in a room together and we're saying, you know, yellow 200, we all kind of know what that is, even if the implementation and our respective uh, tools are different, right? Yeah. And I'll definitely plus one, uh, at least in this case, like HSL being a little easier to, uh, wrap your your head around. I, I I think it's a lot easier for us to describe like, oh, this is a lighter version of the same color um, here because we can see like the the hue is the same, the saturation is the same. If you're trying to reason about that in like with like RGB, for instance, or yeah. with hex codes, it's a lot harder to think about this as oh, they're you know the same hue. It's just we had to add more red, green, and blue. Like, no one thinks about colors in terms of, what if I add a little bit more red or blue? No one thinks about it that way. Yeah, and I've seen a lot of stuff where people will just, um, they will adjust the 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 first value, the, um, yeah. the hue, right? To get, like, a very, um, you know, we have, like, these color systems, like, uh, you know, the, the uh, I can't even think of them off the name, but, like, you know, when you have, like, mm -hmm. complementary one, so you can basically just take that value and subtract 180 to get the complementary value. Um, but it's really easy to get nice color pairings, uh, like mathematically, yeah. than, than, than you probably could with hex. Um, yeah. Maybe you could do it with hex, but it's a lot more complicated. I think I think friend of the show Stephanie Eccles has demonstrated recently the uh, I, I think she did it on her Learn with Jason stream, just the using the the hue yeah. and like um, like CSS custom properties to to get that that range. It's such a a, a lovely cute trick, and I I, I think it's super helpful um that was a great episode yeah actually you know what i will grab that for the chat as well if you're not watching learn with jason you totally should um let's see yeah there's been some good stuff recently uh we had one on notion last week that was really good um stuff was very good yes and i'll drop that in the the there's that boom all right that is not where I meant to go. Okay, cool. So we we can see how like a lot of your your primitives, the core idea of like these are the colors that are allowed to exist, or these are the spacing mm -hmm. values that are allowed to exist on our site. I have to find them here. Is there more you wanted to explore on global tokens or uh Um, I think so so there's kind of three big things, uh three big kind of visual style uh things that we looked at with design systems is color type and spacing, right? Like 90% 90, 90 of everything we do in CSS is one of those three things. Um, and so kind of having having a system around those three things gets you so far, you know, gets you like 90% of the way there. Um, so we have spacing. Uh, there is an article that I refer to often uh, by Nathan Curtis on Medium called um, 
uh, space and design systems. And uh, that's really kind of informed like how I uh, how I look at like terminology around spacing, uh, the, the, the kind of the, the values in the spacing. Um, so if you scroll down a bit, he talks a bit about, uh, like here, here's kind of what I was saying, right? Like here's all the uh, kind of CSS rules and those, those first few color, space, size, type, that's like a large chunk of all of the styles that we write and everything mm -hmm. else is, you know, uh, it, it's a lot less than that, right? Um, so in, in doing things like color, uh, space and type, we want to create these kind of higher, we want to create hierarchy, right? Uh, where the values are far enough apart that we can distinguish one from the other so that we're not, if you look at a lot of sites, um, their type sizes are like, they have a 13 pixel and a 14 pixel and a 15 pixel and a 16 yeah. pixel. And it's because, you know, if you, once you have a lot of designers and a lot of engineers and you don't have a system, you're oftentimes just eyeballing something and just putting in a value or like the designer is just like, I'm going to bump this up by one pixel, you know, and that mm -hmm. looks a little bit better. Um, and so you end up with literally every value. And so it really makes it hard to create, a, to establish a hierarchy. And so in Nathan's article, he talks about kind of mathematically doing like something that's more like exponential than, uh, I forget what the other, the other term was. Um, and you can scroll down a little bit. Here we go. He's talking about like uh, memorable numbers, right? So a lot of times I'll kind of use uh, like multiples of four. Um, and so he talks about using like kind of like uh, the scaling, right? So the top scaling in blue, the stuff is a lot closer together. And if you have an eight and a nine, it's it's very hard to distinguish like between those two, right? But if you use the green one, it's very obvious like eight pixels versus 16 versus 32. Uh, so when we're doing spacing, we can, we can and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be this scale, but I found this to be really useful particularly when, uh, you know, screen sizes uh, are typically multiples of four, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so so this kind of helps distinguish things. And then you can create rules around, like, when is something 16 pixels apart versus, you know, 32 pixels apart or something like that. And it's generally, like, how closely related are the, is this information? Um, but then he goes on to talk about different kind of terminology for, uh, for things like uh, padding, right, which he refers to as like uh, uh, inset spacing versus like uh, stack, you know, which is like vertical, uh, inline, which is horizontal. So it's really like, how do we describe all, uh, that's a great uh, it, example there. So inset is like the, the padding within, inline is the margins, the horizontal margin, uh, and then stack is the vertical margin, and then we have like kind of uh, squished, meaning like that there's less padding on top than on the sides and, you know, a lot of different things. So going back to, uh, to dogs of horse, uh, we basically just kept it super basic, right? We've got mm -hmm. uh, spacing four, spacing eight and spacing 16. And I don't, I try not to, at least in the global tokens, I don't call this like, I don't t-shirt size this because I want, I want it to be really obvious, like how much spacing this, this is. Yeah. Uh, so this is four pixels, eight pixels, 16 pixels. Um, because, you know, if you're doing small, medium, large, let's say we want to, we decide we need a 12 pixel in there, like then what, right? If slightly um, so bigger could, medium or underwhelming yeah. large. Right, exactly. Um, so yeah, so we've kept it really small for this particular project. And then as, you know, maybe we add our, our like dog page, right? or our sign up, our, uh, our submit a dog form that requires some different spacing values. We can add those in as needed. Um, and then we have our font stack here, which uh, similar to the colors, uh, I'm using like kind of numbers here uh, just to represent like the relative size. Um, Cause you know, a lot, a lot of devs struggle with like the rems because they don't know what like the, you know, necessarily that one rem is, is by default, it's 16 pixels. Um, or, you know, the quick math of like, you know, what's, what's 14 pixels, right? Yeah. Um, but so we have that, we've got our, 
line height just very generically uh, I like to use like 1.3 for text and 1.1 for headings like if I'm just doing a quick and dirty system um, but you might want to do like uh, line height pairings with your uh, you know with each font size and your scale oh I see uh, that's another, another thing we could do as well but for here we're just very generically saying that you know at any of these sizes if the text is you know if it's for body text uh, that's the line height, and then for headings, it's uh, tight, a little bit tighter. Uh, and then we have our, our different font weights. Um, we, we could potentially have different font families, like if we wanted to do a font pairing where the heading is a different font than the text, we could do that. Um, and then we, we can add things like animation timing, uh, scale factor. So we're using scale factor for when we hover over uh, one of the cards, the image will scale by 5%. Um, and then uh, we're setting our border width. Um, so let's uh, let's uncomment our contextual tokens and see what what happens. With All right. Since we're we're getting short on time here. Yeah. Sure that time really flies sense. by so fast. It really, it really okay. Does. So now we're starting to get okay. We're getting some spacing. Uh, uh, if we scroll down a little bit, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, yeah. Not not really much. We got we've got some. Um, we're using like a sans serif font now, um, and we've got some a little bit of spacing going on. Um, I think I don't know if the if you increase uh, like um, move the middle bar so that, that the, there's more uh, of the yeah we can yeah so I guess the the responsive styles have not kicked in yet. That must be oh right okay that's so okay we'll talk about that in a second. So here we'll we'll just look at these contextual tokens yeah um we have so instead of saying like color text light and dark um because a lot of times now we're making dark modes i, I try not to specify what that is so, oh i see uh so default is like you know if you're if you have a light background uh your text default is like a black right on a white background and then inverse is the opposite right so if you, if we were to do a dark mode we could simply just say that color text uh, you know if a uh, user prefers color scheme dark, then uh, text inverse is black and text de uh, text default is white or, you know, right? Yeah. And so we're just flipping those things. Uh, and then we have uh, our brand color and our accent color. And so while we might have like, uh, you know, a green color in our palette or a purple color in our palette, like we don't necessarily want those used for text. So here we can we can define specifically like which colors are we using for text. Mm -hmm. which colors are we using for background um and then similarly like uh w w now we can start doing t-shirt sizing for for fonts so that when we declare those later we're not necessarily using the global values we're using these uh, we, we only we have all these different font sizes but we only want these being used for text and we only want these being used for specific headings um and part of that um the font inherit in my reset uh, sets all of the headers to the body styles, right? Of of font, which you can see, well now that we've uncommented this, it's a little, it's a little different. But you, if you remember originally, all of the text was the same size, even though we were using uh, header elements. Yeah. And the reason I do that is because a lot of times developers will use a header element based on visually, like how much bigger it is and not semantically yes. like what it is. So by separating that out, uh, we kind of force devs to use a class to describe this, the size and, and, and separate that entirely from the semantic value so that, so that we're making sure that we're using the correct semantics. Uh, so that's, that's something I've done a while. Um, I'm just looking in the chat. Nasty Director says, can you have too many custom properties within Reason? Uh, do you know if it would lead to performance problems if you had a lot? That's a great question. I actually use SAS for this uh, because unless I need to change the value of a custom property uh, as a result of something that's happening, that the, you know, an action that the user is taking or something like that, I would much rather do this in SAS where it will compile to these values. Mm. So it would uh, actually... The, the underlying styles that would get delivered to the end user would have, instead of having this chain of custom properties, it would have directly like the HSL value or the yep. font family directly That's in right. there. Okay. Yep. 
Yeah, because we don't necessarily, like, yeah, that, that's one of my concerns. Like, I only used uh, custom properties here because it's easy to demonstrate in uh, in a pen, right? Um, and it's, and it's again, it, like, stack, it follows that kind of stack agnostic thing. Like, maybe you're not using SAS, right? Maybe you're using CSS and JS or, you know, whatever, but this this kind of applies. Um, but, yeah, my, my personal preference is to do all of this in SAS, and then we can use uh, custom properties where we want to write like CSS that's that has a default, but maybe the, the developer can add an inline style that changes the custom property to affect like the width or how many how many cards should be, uh, you know, how many of these on large screens, how many cards should there be, right? And we actually, uh, when we get into the component tokens, we'll see an example of that. Um, so we've got our headings, we've got our uh, spacing values, uh, and uh, like border radius and things like that. So let's uh, let's uncomment the component tokens, and we'll kind of dig into what's going on here. Yeah, because this is really gonna make stuff happen, right? Yeah, this will be like the full shebang here, pretty much. Oh man, it's a whole site. Look at what we did, y'all. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, one other thing I think we need to do in the HTML, I think I need to add a class here, uh, to, okay. uh, uh, what is it, all the way at the top of this, uh, the div, I think it's, the, or no, in the header, I think we want to just do class header in that. So that just, uh, that's just adding a quick media query, I think. Yeah, that does that. So now when we resize uh, to like small screens, it'll be centered on there. So that was just a little quick media query thing I did. But now we can go into the CSS and we'll check out these, uh, what, what's going on with these. Yeah. Tokens. There's so much here. Where where best to start? It's, I think I'm up all the way down. Oh. Yep, yep. oh no. Oh no, I left it. I left it. Uh, we're getting close. We're getting close. Here we go. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Here yep. we go. Found it. Okay, so uh, so what's going on here is uh, so we have component tokens for our cards, which is like uh, like the cupcake card, right? Is just the container. So we're saying uh, that the card should have a max width of three hundred pixels, and then later on in in our layout, uh, like at the very bottom of just what's visible here, you see main max width. We've got a calculation there that's saying that like. The max width should essentially be uh, uh, whatever our max count of cards is times the max card width plus uh, plus like the gutters, right? Oh, I love that. Um, okay, got it. Yeah, and so we're not even doing we're not even using a media query here. Uh, in the style, we're using uh, CSS Grid uh, to do like an auto fit, and uh, and and then we're plugging in these values for like max width, right? Um, so if we scroll back up to to the cards, we can we could like change the max card count to four, and then when we expand uh, the thing, the card you know we'll be able to fit more uh, more more dogs on our page. Code pen, yeah. probably... Codepen's not happy with uh, oh that's to two, nice. and maybe that's uh, or you could also zoom out. I think. Uh, is that um, that'll work? Let's do another, that. Another option. There we go. So yeah, so yeah, we could do four up. You know, we could do maybe two ups the max we want to do. It, you know, but we can we can adjust that in this one spot, um, and not have to like touch any CSS or HTML, right? Um, and maybe maybe we allow developers to control that via inline styles, right? Um, depending on maybe maybe on one page. You want three up, another page you want four up, so you can control that pretty easily here without, uh, you know, having to make changes to the CSS. Um, so we have things like, you know, the the link color. So like when we when we hover over uh, the link color, I think is set to uh, to inherit the the color so that it's not blue by default. But then when we hover over a card, it should change to the brand color, right? Um, can we can we follow yeah. this chain of custom properties to see how that works? Yeah, just, just so we can see kind of the three levels in action. Of course, yeah. Okay, so, so oh, good. So we have the card link color, which is uh, set to color text default. So color text default is black, 
Um, so I guess I don't have that one set through here. Oh, I see. Um, so that one's just going straight to a global token. But uh, other ones in there, I think, like, color... Um, so it's a lot a lot to digest here. I mean, yeah. maybe if you expand that a little bit, it'll be a little that. easier to... Yeah, yeah, yeah that's sure. easier. Put it all on one line. Okay. Uh, at least with the tokens, that makes it a, a little bit easier. Um, see, if, if, if we were working in SAS, it would be a lot easier because we would just have the token files separate from all these different uh, styling uh, values and stuff. Uh, so I think uh, just above this, we go back to the, um, the card component tokens. Here we are. Yeah. So like we have card heading color, right? So that's that's what's being applied to the thing on hover. Um, and so the the card text, uh, what is it? Card link color, right? Because basically the whole thing is enclosed in a link. Um, and so all of the, by default, all of the um, text would be blue. So here we're setting that to black. And then we're saying card heading color, when that's hovered, becomes color text brand, which then points to color blue 800, I think, or 600. Yeah, um, the color text brand, if I look at that, if I look for where that's first defined. Mm -hmm. Then that, that'll be, it'll take you to the, uh, the contextual tokens. Right. And that's pointing to blue 600. So we're essentially like chaining those things. So if we wanted to change, we could either change like uh, maybe we want that to be the accent color instead. So we could change the component level one, but then maybe we want to change our brand color to like purple 600, right? We can change the, the contextual token to purple 600. And because we've already set our, um, our component token to color background brand, that will get that change automatically, right? We don't have to find every instance where that's used and change it there also. We so, can just change it at this level. Sorry, so change color background brand? Is that what you're you're saying? And so Yeah, so like let's let's go into at the in our color palette at the top. Let's yeah. make a new color, right? Let's do that. And we we can say like uh color purple six hundred. Color purple um, six hundred and I'll just slap in we'll just say like Rebecca purple or something like that. Or right, yeah, there you go. Boom. So uh so nothing happens, right? Right. But we can now scroll down to our component tokens, and we can change uh, color. Component um, tokens or contextual try... tokens? Uh, in contextual. Well, we can do either way, right? So we can do color, background, brand, right? Change that to purple. Oops. Color, purple, I can spell. Okay. And then we should see... Now our brand, now everywhere we're using our brand color for a background will change, right? So but okay, our, so this is interesting to me because like this blue, it it is the same blue that that blue was, but because right. you've got this layer of abstraction, that's right. Okay, very cool. So so maybe like we we only want this new brand color to be used for like our header, right? Um, for or where where background colors are used. Um, or if we wanted it to be specifically just the header, we could change that in the component token, right? Um, so if we change like um, color text brand to purple, then when we hover that, that would get the change as well. Right. So, or maybe we want to just change a card, right? Maybe we want that to just be the accent color. So we could we could go down to the card component token and instead of using uh for uh sorry yeah it's hard it's up it's hard to navigate it? this thing it's a lot of yeah okay it, so it, it's especially hard if you you're not the one who wrote it yeah um, okay so here like we are card, card heading color if we change instead of color text brand change that to color text accent okay and uh, this probably is not accessible so we probably sure want to do that um on a light background but uh, now when we hover over Cupcake, the, the the name should turn yellow. I was having a lot of weird issues with, uh, with like, n these kind of, like, recursive uh, tokens with CSS custom properties. Like, some of it just wasn't working. So, mm. I don't know, this would work, but this would, this would probably work in SAS. <laughs> um, I, uh, I would have to dig in more to, like, why that's happening. I don't know what the limits are. Oh, 
you don't have a you don't have a color yellow 600 um your no but it shouldn't matter because our text accent is already oh oh. yeah because you're you're asking so it's not accessible but i'm just gonna change it to a color we we already have in the palette so okay yeah there we go yeah so we could we could change it that way right um so yeah these different levels of tokens give you the ability to make these massive changes at either like a large uh you know like a high level where we're changing it everywhere changing it on just uh one context of how it's used or in this case like an individual component right so if we had another component that was using color uh text brand we're not affecting that by changing the card value to color brand uh, color text accent right yeah gotcha. okay that is that is really cool i, I like this like kind of three-tiered structure I, I i i've had people try to explain that to me before and a lot of times it felt kind of overblown but like i, I think now actually yeah. getting to like play with this i can see where where that's working out because yeah. find and replace them they're never as simple as you think and the cool thing about tokens too is like you don't need to be a developer to be able to make these changes right a designer can easily go into a text file and, and make these changes mm-hmm. and and push that to you know push that to a repo uh you can even edit it like in the github interface on um, um, you know you go into the repo and you just click edit on the file and do it right there and and commit the change oh yeah and now, because all of these, uh, you know, your components are consuming these tokens, and your CSS framework is is using all these tokens, you'll see those changes across all your platforms, across web, mobile, or across web, iOS, and Android, just by touching these color values. Mm-hmm. And you know, previously, like when I was at Groupon, we changed our brand color from like one shade of green to another shade of green, and it was literally like a six month effort to make sure that it was changed in every single place that we needed to change uh and it was just you know we're changing a hex value right so with with this setup we could have done that in literally 10 seconds right yeah the thing you change the color you push it boom a- across all the platforms is changed or you can do this for theming right so we can do uh let's say we want to do a uh you know uh breast cancer awareness month right uh we want to change our header to pink and so we can do that here by essentially we described our tokens and then we could do theming where we we apply overrides to these custom properties to a class and then we just slap this class on the body that says okay the bot when the body is uh you know uh awareness right uh then these custom properties override the default ones right? mm, and so okay. now now the head now the color color background brand is now pink right uh or call you know more specifically like color header a uh, header color background is pink right um and so we can do like thematic changes like that very easily we can do a dark mode we can do a b testing where we're saying like hey uh if if we change this button from green to blue like how does that affect the, the click-through rate right um and we can do all that via the tokens without uh, a huge engineering effort that's awesome i think even just just simply like understanding how how these tokens work and how you can have abstractions on these i i think that in and of itself is such a, a powerful tool that that's super cool um and and i also like that you're using your your tokens like even the names in and of themselves communicate things like w- like yes this isn't just a blue but like like you said like the we we can we can pass around this knowledge to designers and developers that a 600 shade of blue should work pretty well against a light background like okay yeah. that's fairly memorable right like i i could go tell my team this and and then if they need colors like they can pick like a fairly accessible contrast um without having to like you know even really run this through the checker and stuff like that and it's all still going to be aligned with our brand goals yeah, and another cool thing about using SAS is like we can be as verbose as we want with the tokens because it all compiles to the value, right? So, mm. uh, you know, some of some of the uh, the component tokens can get really long because we're dealing with things like variants and states and things like that, right? Like maybe you have like a card, you know, background blue hover, <laughs> you know, you, 
So you've got all sorts of different uh, modifiers. So you, you could potentially have like five or six strings in there. Uh, and having all that just compiled to a, like an HSL value is, is uh, really valuable. Yeah. I think I want to share this. Pen. I'm not, you know, usually big on using code pen. So I don't actually know what the best way to share this is. Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, you can oh, just down here. cut and paste that, that link in, in the URL, or you can do that. As there well. we go. Uh, I use CodePen a lot, uh, particularly for work. So I have like a default, uh, you can set a, a pen as a template. Um, and so I just have a blank pen that pulls in our CSS framework. Um, and then you can open a pen with the framework and just start oh, okay. prototyping with our CSS framework. And so, um, we do that a lot. Uh, I work with the designers to just kind of like get stuff in the browser as fast as possible, right? So the goal, the goal is kind of like we're delivering front end code instead of pictures of websites. Yeah. Uh, we have all the HTML and CSS uh, in a place where where it's good, and then the developers are getting that, and they can focus more on like how it works than what it looks like, right? And we can take that prototype also. We can put it in front of users. We can put it in front of stakeholders. They can see it on their actual device. And we can kind of uh, validate our our decisions earlier in the process than if we were to spend like three months engineering it and then putting it in front of users and finding out that that's not what they wanted. Yes. All right. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, Mike. This has been fantastic. I want to once again recommend that people follow you. And I'm sure folks have questions. Uh, I think a great time to ask those questions might be your office hours, right? Yeah, come to office hours on uh, Friday, and I'm uh, happy to answer your questions. I've put a link to Mike's Twitch in the, the chat. Y'all, thank you so much for uh, coming today. Um, while while you're, you know, following folks on uh on on twitter you should follow semantics on twitter that's where you'll you'll get all the updates about what we're streaming and when next week we're going to be doing more design work we're bringing on george francis who does a lot of just absolutely creative stuff with generative art i'm Amazing. super yeah it's gorgeous stuff i need to get one of his prints once he's selling them again but um Same. uh we're we're going to be doing some generative art. We're going to be exploring how to extend CSS using the new Houdini APIs. It's a whole a whole lot of stuff I have never done before, um, and so I'm super excited for it. And I hope you'll join me. Uh, that's next Tuesday, 12 p.m. Central. Stick around, y'all. We are going to raid someone. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming. And thank you so much, Mike, for coming on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Bye, y'all.